Greetings, everyone. This is Eric Glazer, and welcome to a recording of Bright Spots in Healthcare produced by Shared Purpose Connect. Each episode, we bring leaders together to not only inform you, our audience, but also unearth bright spots, successes at hospitals, health plans, and other healthcare-related organizations around the country. Our goal is to identify as many bright spots as possible so that you can determine if the ideas shared during this episode can be applied at your organization. We believe this approach of finding a bright spot and cloning it is the most effective way to improving healthcare in our lifetime. My team wants to remind you, if you're sitting on a beach right now, enjoying your summer vacation, to press subscribe if you haven't already on your podcast app. And if you would be so kind to throw in a couple of comments wherever you listen to the show, Spotify, Apple, Google Play, wherever you listen to podcasts, Amazon, uh, please give us a rate and review that helps more folks find the show and identify more bright spots uh, to incorporate into their organization and make healthcare better for all of us in this country. Uh, during today's episode, we're going to be discussing how innovation looks at Nashville General Hospital. Every major city can draw in tourists, talent, and prosperity. But it also faces disparity, inequality, and gaps in everyday healthcare. Nashville, Tennessee is no different. A recent report shows that African Americans are two times likely to develop diabetes, and Hispanic men are 12 times more likely to experience discrimination when seeking medical care. Solutions to health inequities and health disparities take a broad approach to education and adequate resources and solutions. And that is what our guest today is going to speak about. Our guest is none other than Dr. Joseph Webb, the Chief Executive Officer of Nashville General Hospital. Nashville General Hospital developed the Congregational Health and Education Network, CHEN for short, as a 501c3 with local churches and educational institutions. CHEN's mission is to increase health education to lower health disparities. The CHEN framework is built upon four pillars, education starting in kindergarten, health literacy, access to care, and member support. So Dr. Welb, welcome to Bright Spots in Healthcare. Appreciate you taking the time. I want to start off um, maybe with you providing us a little bit of context. Tell us a little bit about Nashville General Hospital and the market that you're in, the community that you serve, and maybe what makes your organization uh, a little bit unique. Okay, and thank you very much. It's uh, certainly a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for the invite. Nashville General Hospital is a 150-bed uh, licensed uh, tertiary hospital, public hospital, it is the uh, public hospital for Metropolitan Nashville and Davidson County. Um, we're the index teaching hospital for Meharry Medical College. And um, we've been open now for, uh, since 1890, roughly around 133 years uh, as the uh, city's essential hospital. We are a member of America's essential hospitals, which is, uh, the public hospitals across the country, uh, a uh, an advocacy group uh, housed in Washington, D.C., uh, with about uh, 325 to 30 members strong. So uh, we uh, we're here in Nashville. Nashville is 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 considered to be the healthcare capital of the nation uh, because of the uh, obvious reasons. The amount of healthcare that's here, we have a uh, HCA's headquarters uh, located here, uh, Vanderbilt University, as well as Ascension. All three have major institutions here in the city. So you can imagine uh, what the market is like with those private and for-profit systems. And uh, being a smaller public hospital, uh, we do work collaboratively with all of them. We do receive patients from them on occasion uh, that are in need of care, but no longer have the resources to cover that care. So we are the safety net hospital for Nashville. 
That's great background. I, I want I want to talk about equity and access and how you're innovating to do that. I mean, providing equitable access is obviously the key to high quality, uh, a high quality healthcare service. So, how are you at NGH being a public hospital? And I think all of us, when we hear public hospital, we hear limited resources in the back of our mind speaking. So, I'd like you to kind of address that a bit, but like how has NGH invested in providing the national community in, in types of services that provide more equitable access and maybe provide us with a specific example as well, if that's okay. Yes. Um, so just as a, um, as a, um, as a highlight, uh, as a public hospital, you know, you're, you're starting with sub some subsidy from the, uh, the city or the city county government uh, to help to cover the cost. So you want to be very um, economically sound in the way you deliver health care because if uh, if you know that your patients are likely to have uh, more chronic conditions that they're dealing with, uh, multiple comorbidities, and they don't have resources to uh, to, to seek the care that the level that they might if they had insurance, then they are likely doing things like struggling to get access to new, proper nutrition, which is a key contributor to their health outcomes. Uh, and so for us, one of the things that we did was to create a uh, what we call a food pharmacy. It's a food pantry, essentially, but it is centered around uh, foods that are more nutritious for the individual based on their particular chronic condition. In other words, if you're diabetic, then it's going to be food that's going to be low in sugar, low in uh, the carbs so that you don't uh, get exposed to a lot of that. And then uh, if you're hypertensive, it's going to be food that's low in sodium and the like. Now, one of the key areas that we found to be effective in the food pharmacy was we have a cancer program here as well, uh, and it is a very busy program, but what we found was that uh, a lot of our patients and a lot of patients that receive cancer care will struggle to get access to food. And so the food that they get then needs to be food that's going to add, keep their weight up, keep their pounds on, because otherwise they'll have to go off their uh, 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 their treatment regime. And so the food pharmacy, uh, which is uh, something that the patient receives a prescription for uh, based on their, uh, uh, their questionnaire that's uh, administered to them that asks the questions about their food insecurity status. And if they test positive, then the physician will write an order. And so the food pharmacy then receives that order. The patient goes in and picks up their food. It's a 12 week, uh, uh, initial timeline that they're able to get access to food. Meanwhile, we have individuals like dietitians and social workers working with them to see if their status is going to change. But the patient that is a cancer patient uh, who otherwise would be removed from uh, their treatment, then it increases their likelihood of mortality or death. So for us, it, it, we didn't expect this to happen but our patients that are cancer patients ended up uh, with a better survivorship rate uh, than historically had occurred. So the food pharmacy not only works for those individuals that are dealing with chronic conditions, but also those individuals that have uh, the uh, uh, conditions of cancer and don't have the resources to buy adequate food. So the food pharmacy was done in order to keep our patients healthier so that they did not get in a crisis and, and end up in the emergency department. And the guideline is that uh, anywhere from 60 to 70% of your costs will be driven by five to 10% of your patients, particularly those that are in crisis. So that, that's one of the ways that we're meeting the needs of the community uh, by making sure that they have proper food and nutrition uh, and uh, helps to prevent them as, as a preventive measure from having, you know, more exacerbating conditions. Uh, a few follow-ups. Reimbursement for the food pharmacy, does that come from a commercial plan, Medicaid, Medicare, or is it completely funded, uh, reimbursement-free by the hospital? How does that work? Well, um, 
one of the neat things about uh, feeding a population is it's a uh, it's an easy sale. Uh, we've had uh, private insurance groups that have made contributions. We had one group that uh, contributed our uh, our coolers uh, and and basically stated that any equipment that we needed for the food pharmacy, they would be willing to fund it. Our, our foundation uh, also has a uh, has access to the uh, Second Harvest Food Bank, which is a, a major food bank here in the community. And so we get food through that, as well as our employees that make contributions through the foundation can also earmark their uh, their donations to go to the food farms. So it's multiple ways that we get it. And we have a dietary here uh, as well that when we have overflow of food, we can store our food there. And in some cases, food that we like that we don't have, we can just get it through the dietary. Okay, so if I just so all of this is funded through donations, private insurance companies provide donations, mm -hmm. hospital foundation that you oversee or your organization oversees right. Right. Uh, um, to the to, to the pharmacy. Your mm -hmm. employees sometimes earmark donations for the pharmacy, and then other local vendors also donate resources as well. Absolutely, yes. Just just to kind of take a step back for a moment, so we uh, can we get a sense. When people walk through your doors uh, at a you know general percentage level, it doesn't have to be exact. Uninsured, Medicaid, Medicare, private insurance, just roughly, so that we can get a sense of like your population mix. Yeah, um, we have been able to get our our hospital to a point of attracting sixty percent of our patients are paying patients. They're covered with some type of insurance or third party payer. 40% uh, are going to be indigent or not able to cover the entire cost. And so they go on a type of uh, payment arrangement. So it's, it's basically 60-40. Okay, 60-40. And of those 40, there's probably a, a, a significant portion that end up not being able to pay at all. My guess. Absolutely. Yes, completely indigent. Got, got it. Tell me a little bit about how... Um, how the program does the how does the program work after the prescription and the 12 weeks of service is there anything incorporated into the program around uh, adherence is there anything how does how do people get extended if they need it and ha have you been able to does it tie into anything on the clinical side into a medical record or anything about the in the member journey or the consumer journey outside of the pharmacy itself Absolutely. It actually, the prescription itself is entered into the electronic health record. That's how the physician retrieves it. And then the physician uh, then, well, the order rather that this person is food insecure, then it describes the condition and the individual then is uh, written a prescription that goes to the food pharmacy where the registered dietitian manages and oversees. And so then that dietitian is uh, also combined with the social worker who is in the care management program in the ambulatory division. We have about 25 uh, clinics overall in our hospital of all different specialties. And so we refer to that as our care management program, which um, is under the chronic care model. Uh, and it addresses uh, the patient's own engagement, self-care. So they learn about their condition. If they're diabetic, they're in a setting where they're being taught about the effects of diabetes and how they uh, are, can best deal with that as a condition that they have to live with, hypertension and other chronic conditions. So the patient is engaged in their own care. And so self-management is a critical part. And then the follow-ups are scheduled through the, uh, we utilize the patient-centered medical home model uh, so that system allows the patient to be scheduled for their primary care visits and any referrals that they have to go to specialists, it's all under that umbrella. And uh, the patient-centered specialty practice is basically the, uh, the other side of the coin for the patient-centered medical home. So those patients are cared for under that umbrella with the knowledge that they are also food insecure and that they have those chronic conditions. So all aspects of their care uh, are being addressed under the care management program. They're not just left hanging out there. 
Okay, let me summarize that for everyone. So prescription goes to the pharmacy. The registered dietitian almost plays the role as the pharmacist overseeing mm -hmm. uh, nutrition in partnership with care management, which is a social worker, probably a master's or an L LCSW. And then they're able to help manage the self-care for the condition. Right. The, the entire PCMA, so does that mean if the social worker believes there's a need for a referral that hasn't yet been uh, made that they could reach out through the EMR to the primary care doctor to get some of that, some of those appointments made or uh, how does that all work? You, no, you're exactly right. You're, you're going on the right track there. The, the social worker has access to that electronic health record and they can make notations in that record as to the recommendations and the care. So you have a, uh, a nurse practitioner uh, in the clinic, the primary care clinic and all of the staff that are working there to make sure that the patient is also following up on their visits. And so we're checking their A1C, we're checking their blood pressures, and we're making sure that we're seeing a trend where this is affecting them and they're moving in the right direction. So those are the metrics that we're looking for. How many patients come through the pharmacy annually? The food pharmacy? Yes. Um, you know, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, we're constant. We're doing this every day, so it's 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 quite a few. Uh, every patient that comes into the hospital has this questionnaire administered to them, the food insecurity questionnaire. I know that because I came into the hospital with for a visit with uh, my wife, and uh, that questionnaire was administered to us, and they didn't know who we were. Uh, so it was a actually it was a, a traveler's nurse. She didn't know who I was. So she administered the questionnaire to my wife. And I thought, okay, we know that every patient is getting this questionnaire. So I couldn't tell you exactly how many right now. I'm sure that, I mean, they know that, but I just didn't get that information. Yeah. Sorry about that. I mean, that, yeah. but yes, but I, I think where I'm going and my listeners know, like what I'm trying to do is make sure everyone has the high level information to enable them to think, can we do this? Or how can we do this where we are? Uh, do you have a sense and if you don't, we can move off of the annual budget. And I know you're you're great. You're you're generating funds through donations. Is is there an annual budget to run this food pharmacy that you're aware of? That if people are listening to the show, they could get a sense of how much money they would need to raise to keep this thing going. Well, because uh, our funds are coming from so many different sources. And as I said, one of them uh, is our employee annual contributions that they make, where there's a payroll deduction each pay period goes into the uh, foundation, and a portion of that gets earmarked for the food pharmacy. But then also the uh, the Second Harvest Food Bank, uh, which uh, will distribute in this region about 20 to 25 million pounds of food a year. So the cost of it is not something that uh, I've really calculated as far as what you would need. This is about our uh, six, about seven years that we've been operating the food pharmacy now. And certainly if uh, there's some contact information that if anyone wanted to follow up to get some more insight into some details of that, I could have the uh, the individuals that operate the food pharmacy make sure that we get that information to them. Okay, great. I'll, I'll, I'll circle back to the end of the episode and ask you to kind of figure out how people could, could could weave their way to get that information. I I, I actually want to ask you then another question. Let's, let's get away from, from the money to run it, but like what would be the blueprint that a healthcare leader would need to have? Like if you were going to act as a consultant to healthcare leaders around the rest of the country on how to create a similarly successful food pharmacy at another hospital, you know, what are like, four or five, six things, I don't want to limit you, but just but that you would need to include in that blueprint. What should people be thinking about when they're thinking about initiating a program like this? One of the things that we started to do here initially was to create a risk stratification model. So you can get a feel for uh, the level of risk of the patient population that you're dealing with. So that gives you an idea of what your... Uh, your, your patient population looks like. So you have a low risk, moderate risk, high risk. There are different tools that you can use for risk stratification, but I would suggest do that initially. Uh, 
and uh, you must have the uh, the uh, providers, and they need to be educated and informed as to the criticality of the nutritional deficit that exists among this patient population. They obviously know the value of it, but they don't really always know the deficit. And so you would need to educate your providers on that. So that justifies the need for the program, uh, a viable screening process. Uh, and we have a tool that we use and we administer that. And we thought that we would cast a big net. So you, if, you, if you wanna capture everyone, then just administer it to everyone. It only takes a few minutes. So have a viable tool. Uh, make sure you have registered dietitian associated with the program because you want that expertise so that when that patient walks into that room, we give them a little tote bag uh, and it's set up like a grocery store and there's coolers. And so when they walk in, they get a, uh, a, a, a list of, um, of, of um, you know, um, what um, uh, directions or instructions on how to prepare certain food. Uh, and so they get that. And so the registered dietitian is able to help them with that. And then there's a the social worker who is looking at their home condition or home setting and looking for opportunities to help them to transition to a better economic situation where they can not be dependent on food from the hospital or from food pantries. If that doesn't happen, then we continue to provide that until we can get them to a better place. Uh, but the social worker is responsible for that. And then there's the structure, the physical setting, uh, the staff, uh, the, uh, the food, where the food is actually housed. You need the coolers because you wanna have fresh fruits and vegetables there for them. And then you have the shelf stable products so it's set up kind of like you can you can walk in and it's a little grocery store. So you can go to the side of the, the, the food pharmacy that uh, houses the food that you're going to need if you're, you know, a hypertensive or if you're a diabetic or if you're a cancer patient. The food's kind of distributed according to those uh, different structures. So that those are the things that I would suggest that you you would want to do. Great. I, I, I count at six. I, I want to I have some follow ups on a bunch of them. Let me just summarize the six, make sure I got that right. Keep okay. Me um, risk stratification model uh, to get a feel for the level of risk of the, of the pa patient population that you are dealing with. Number two, providers need to be educated and informed and be and buy in to the program. So you got to yeah. get through a provider engagement, we'll call that. Three is a viable screening process. Four is you have to have a registered dietitian. Now you use the word singular. Do you need do you have to have a small team or could one registered dietitian own the program? Well, because we have registered dietitians in our dietary as a hospital, we have one that is assigned to the food pharmacy. So if that one is out, then there's someone else who can you know fill in and work with them. They all understand how it works. Got it. And so number five was social worker. Same thing. You take one of your social workers assigned right. and then have right. a back when they're out for a vacation. Right. And that's what I refer to as the structure of the program. You need the staff, the hours, the physical setting. And uh, and it's key that you have, you know, the coolers so that you can have the fresh fruits and vegetables because that gets to be a big part of what people can't get access to in food deserts. And if they don't have the resources uh, and the cost of it is pretty high too. So you want to have that display of nice, colorful, fruits and vegetables, and that's very attractive to people. Great, and that's, I wrote that a six, structure and physical setting. Let me make sure, when you say staff, I understand the dietitian and social worker, but I'm assuming you need some other folks who are not providers or uh, clinicians or professional, healthcare professionals, I'll call them, but you need just folks that, to, to, to run the actual pharmacy or the store itself, is that correct? Now the registered dietitian is basically the operator of the store. Okay. Uh, but the other individuals are the support staff for the program itself to make sure that the patient is transitioning, you know, from one place to the other, that they're, first of all, that they're going to the food pharmacy. So the social worker makes sure that the individual is following up on their appointments and doing the things that they need to do. The dietitian is going to take them once they walk through the door the dietitian is going to instruct them on which 
which foods they should select if they're a first timer and uh, give them recipes on different types of ways to prepare the food. And you'd be amazed at the number of people who have never really prepared food that didn't have huge amounts of sodium in it. And how do you avoid that? What are some recipes that you can use to cook healthier food? So all of that is provided by the dietitian in that setting. Right. So before we leave, last question before we leave the food pharmacy topic, the dietitian and social worker are the key professionals, the dietitian as the operator. Is there any other additional staff you need in the food pharmacy, whether it's to, to actually stock the, the shelves and the roof and the coolers or anything else? Like what, what's your headcount to run on a daily basis, the pharmacy beyond the dietitian and the social worker? Now, we have uh, their staff in the foundation that also helps to do some of that work. And then we have our dietary. So when the food is brought onto the dock, the dietary helps them to make sure that if there's overflow, then they use the dietary uh, capacity to help house the food. And then as it goes down in inventory within the actual food pharmacy itself, that's the, that's the benefit of having a dietary that feeds all of your patients in your hospital that can help to support, uh, you know, managing the inventory within the food pharmacy. And when you say the dietary, that is literally your kitchen that. Yeah, food services. All your patients and maybe even does some of the, your employees as well, probably, right? The, the... Mm -hmm. Yes. Great. Yeah. All right. Let, let's let's talk. Let's shift away from this for a moment. Because you know, you mentioned the community. We all know that healthcare, uh, to be very effective, has to be local. How does Nashville General Hospital go beyond the four walls of the facility to reach out to the community and serve the greater good for the for the Nashville community? Okay, so um, one of the things that we created here is a. Uh, is a faith-based initiative. It's called the Congregational Health and Education Network. Uh, the term, yes, CHIN is the acronym. Uh, the driving force behind that is education, uh, not he necessarily health education, but education in general, education attainment. Because of the social determinants of health, um, we find that education attainment uh, or your level of education is going to have an impact on your ability to survive uh, economically. Joe, could you could you quickly uh, define what educational attainment means when you say it versus just education? Okay, education attainment is what level of education do you have? Uh, are you, do you have a high school education? Do you have a, you know, an associate's degree, a bachelor's, uh, or, you know, that's, that's going to determine largely where you uh, fit on the social gradient of health. Uh, if you, if you looked at the research, you'll see that the lower education attainment will usually be where the the worst health outcomes will uh, lie. Uh, and so in order to utilize the science that's out there in the literature and the research that's been done, we know that if we can create a longitudinal effect of individuals having access to uh, programs that are not necessarily four-year college programs, but we have a, uh, a health science program here where we have uh, a... Uh, imaging program, uh, radiology and imaging program for individuals that, that over a two year period, we have six months program like um, nurse assistants, uh, community health workers. Uh, so we have some short term programs and some long term programs. We're working now collaboratively with the uh, local uh, community college uh, to expand that into, into the settings of their programs. And we'll be looking at grants to help to cover the cost, but what we're doing is we're targeting individuals within, it's, a, it's right now about 108 congregations, primarily African-American uh, congregations. Uh, and so we're utilizing- you say 108? Yes. Okay. Uh, and um, so 
right now we're uh, pushing education attainment as when you, when you gave the four pillars of chin, you notice that that was one of them. Uh, health and literacy, there's also a uh, activities that are interwoven into the care management program that addresses health literacy. Uh, we have that going on. And then supporting the church network and uh, access to health care. Those are the four pillars. Education attainment uh, has a, education has a stronger correlation among all of the social determinants of health. If you're thinking about access to food, access to housing, access to transportation, you know, ac access to income and uh, education attainment, education attainment, as it changes, all of those other determinants will likely change for the patient. That's why we utilize that from a science-based, uh, evidence-based uh, uh, framework. And if we can impact the education of a population from a longitudinal standpoint, then that's going to move, continue to move that population, that targeted population into a better economic uh, level. So on the social gradient of health, that will tend to change. So that's the, that's the premise behind the, uh, the mission of CHIN and focusing on education. Is it, I love it. Is it, do you have the sophistication yet in the program to identify learning disabilities and different sort of potential inherent barriers to moving someone up that gradient uh, in a way that's effective or it's, that's we, we, yeah, we haven't gotten to that point yet, but with, uh, with the expansion now of moving into the Nashville State Community College, uh, that's going to give us, and we're working with the Urban League as well, who is teaming up on this initiative. And so we're expanding it now and looking at uh, workforce issues uh, and, and, and other areas that are where there, there are funds available to help the population, but you must have the structured programs in place in order to make that happen. And so I would, I would, I would believe that uh, that's going to be ultimately another area that we're going to look at. Uh, but right now we haven't gotten to that point. All right. Well, I'm going to ask the same question, but for this one, like, how do we go about building something like this? What's some of the structure that we need to right. build and maybe even scale it so uh, the group could start taking notes and bring it back to their market? Okay, so this one's a little bit different than the food pharmacy. Food pharmacy is obviously more of an internal program, clinical program internal. This one, we began by creating uh, the, uh, the structure of a 501c3 tax exempt corporation. So that houses uh, Chin. Now it has a board of directors and it also has full-time staff. And now, so we're expanding the staff and I know scaling is a, a big part of, of the, uh, the, um, the picture here. Once you are able to get the program set up, how do you scale it to match up with the needs and the population that you have? So scaling is also being done now by bringing on uh, additional community health workers so that we can move them. We're moving them into the churches. And right as we speak, one of the key things that we're doing is an all out uh, questionnaire uh, to all the members so that we can get a profile on each church on some of the issues that are most challenging to them. And it's, it's asking about their health questions and income issues so we're establishing a profile on each each church okay so first obviously form the legalese form of 501c3 i think i think i'm though i'm not an expert in this area but i think to have an official 501c3 you have to have some form of board of directors i think yes you do and then and, and then you need to hire a staff but before we get into the staff and the scale what did you do to fund it? Did you raise money or does the hospital contribute it in partnership? And then the second question is, how did you build your network of, of partners, uh, network of congregations, churches? Okay. Um, so there's actually a, a couple of um, organizations here, and I will say this to you too. I did this before in, in the city of Memphis uh, where there's a, congregational health network 
And so I was already familiar with having meetings with faith-based leaders. And basically we started small, uh, having meetings with faith-based leaders, sharing the idea and the concept. And we started off with about 25 churches. Uh, but as churches found out about it and we continued to bring on staff to go out, I went out into the community, I spoke, uh, interacted with pastors in, in areas where uh, faith leaders uh, congregate, and it just started to grow from there. Uh, so it's pretty much word of mouth. Uh, the concept uh, was solid, and the way it was presented, and keep in mind, this has been, uh, this was started in around 2016. So it's been happening for a while. Okay, so this is what I've written. Um, I'm gonna, so this is what I'm writing down. Form the 501c3, the executive leadership has to go out and do road shows. They need to present and inspire. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to have a sound plan. I, I wanna say business plan, but just a concept plan, like a sound plan to win over the pastors and the leaders of these churches, correct? Yeah, you, want, you want a mission, a vision, and a, uh, a business structure for how this is going to operate. Uh, you want to make sure that you're focusing on the intervention, the outcome that you want to achieve. You know that health disparities is your driving force. And that's really where, you know, health disparities, which are fundamentally caused by social determinants of health, and you can get the attention of individuals because you have the evidence that that is actually, it's all in the science and, and in the literature. So when you present to these individual faith leaders, you know that they are wanting to help the people that are within their congregations. And so once they realize that this vehicle is being designed to help to improve the health outcomes uh, and they're, they're, uh, the epidemic health disparities that certain populations uh, experience, then you can, you can get the audience to, uh, to pay attention to what you're saying. A couple of quick follow-ups. You mentioned scaling by adding CHWs and moving more and getting more of them to move into the churches. You can't really do that without more funds. So where do you need? I feel like there's a step that's missing. Like what, what's yeah, grants? Growth of the grants. organization grants. Grants, because that's that's the reason you want to start with creating your infrastructure, your framework, which is a five hundred one c three tax exempt. So grants and donations. Now, faith-based initiatives are attractive to uh, organizations, foundations, and uh, you know administrators of grants uh, because they know that that's where a number of the minorities, the ones who are most likely to experience these health disparities, will congregate and reside. And so if you can, and, and then there's a a, uh, a certain structure that exists with churches that you don't find anywhere else. It's a structure. It's got a leader and it has a population of people who will oftentimes listen to what the leader is saying. And so if you can get that leader to the point where the message is being communicated and you're following through with the mission and the vision, the grants are out there. Uh, they, uh, we have a, uh, a five-year grant right now that Chin is is working with. It's not the total uh, funder, but it's funding a major portion of it. And that's just, uh, we've had that now for about two and a half years. Okay. I'm going to summarize and then ask you, if assuming I get the summary right, Joel, I'm going to ask you for one last question. Okay. So form the 501c3. <clears throat> you need to go out with the leadership and present and sell to the faith-based leaders in your community and you need to present with to them an already created sound vision and business structure yeah. and you need to tie that vision and business structure to the interventions and outcomes you want to achieve which in this case of course is health disparities that you're going to help reduce via recognizing and addressing social determinants of health mm -hmm. the thing you're going to do then is you're going to raise money via grants faith-based initiatives are attractive to both public funds and foundations that are often the ones that provide those grants. So that's where you go to 
get your meetings and and pitch your concept to earn those grants. Mm -hmm. And then not necessarily what you're guiding everyone to do, but where you're at in your evolution is you're trying to scale by one, adding CHWs into more churches, but even in parallel or prior to that, you're asking all of your member churches, you have 108 of them, to fill out a questionnaire so you get a really full profile of what each one of your 108 members, uh, their, what their congregation's all about, what their community's all about, so you could really match mm -hmm. and understand better because with without data, you know, you can't manage what you don't, you know, what you don't know. You got to have data and numbers, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't manage what you don't, you can't manage what you don't measure. So you're using that questionnaire to get some of that data around each uh, unique population of those 100 natures. I got that. You mentioned that you did this in Memphis. Now you're in Nashville. Okay. Those of you who are not familiar with geography, those cities are what, two and a half, three hours away from each other. Right. Three hours. Different markets. So what are you doing differently in Nashville based upon learnings, the small hiccups and failures that you had in Memphis? What should people be on the lookout to avoid, save some people some grief right now. Where did you make mistakes in Memphis that you're now applying those learnings to Nashville? Now that is a great question. Um, so the biggest addition, and I kind of threw it out earlier, uh, that was made to Chin in Nashville is the education component, education attainment component. Um, and the other piece um, I would say we have to be careful with is you've got to make sure that you're uh, creating a firm foundation for the, uh, the mission and the vision. In Nashville, we're, we are stating clearly that the mission is to reduce health disparities. I mean, that's basically what you're here to do. You're utilizing education attainment to help to facilitate that because from a longitudinal standpoint, if individuals are seeking and gaining more and better access to education and moving up on the socioeconomic ladder, you will start to see health outcomes improve as their economic situation. And that's the science of it. So it's the application of science more so than just a social initiative. Okay, so biggest additions in Nashville is the realization that education attainment is core to making anything work like this around disparities. So, you, so what you need to do is create a firm foundation for the mission and the vision. In this case in Nashville, it's to reduce health disparities by utilizing education attainment. And then you apply secondary research, the science that's already out there to prove that point to go out and then sell people, inspire people, uh, whether they're partners with you, one of the faith-based organizations, or whether they be providing grants, or whether they're educational partners like the community college that you referenced earlier. Right. Now, can't leave out the fact that in order to make this more comprehensive and sustainable, education attainment is obviously a driving force. But you notice that the other three pillars, uh, access to health care, these individuals need to have access to health care while this is going on, right? And then supporting the member churches, you got to make sure that there's liaison, that there are liaison people within the church that are appointed by the faith leader who can interface with your community health worker from the organization chin. And then the other is health literacy is such a, um, a liability in our community and it's it's a hidden liability it's that thing that we don't know about the person is not getting health care uh or is not seeking care for some reason or another could simply be a health literacy issue because you know 88 percent of our population statistically uh uh is going to be not health literate only 12 percent of our population based on research and so we have to be careful 
that we're not allowing ourselves to be undermined by the silent killer health, health literacy. And so you want to make that one a big part of what you're doing. So, so these things, you have to walk and chew gum at the same time. And that's, that's what makes Chin more comprehensive in its approach. Education, attainment, access to health care, uh, supporting, in the beginning, I read supporting the member from the cop. Right. But that's supporting not just, it's really supporting the church, the liaisoning between the church, right. CFU and Chen, and then finally health literacy, which you just dubbed the silent killer. Mm -hmm. Yes. This was super great. I know we are already over on time. Uh, you, we mentioned two big programs here, the food ph pharmacy program and the Chen program, uh, which you did something similar in Memphis. It sounds it probably went pretty well too. How do people learn more about these innovations being done at National General Hospital? How do how do they look into this? Okay, so there's the website for National General Hospital. It is nationalgeneral.org. Uh, I have a website that shares a lot of the things that I'm doing. It's drweb.org. Okay, so nationalgeneral.org. DrWeb.org. We'll put those at the bottom of the description of the show and whatever podcast app you're listening to. If you're watching this on YouTube, NashvilleGeneral.org, DrWeb.org. Uh, you're on your own, but I just gave it to you. Uh, those two sites would be good places to start. Big part. Those are the two places. Those are two good places. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Terrific. I really thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this. Uh, thank you for the time to prepare for it. I know this was a long time coming and our schedules didn't always work. This was super well worth the wait. So I really appreciate it. Uh, for all of those li folks listening, we hope that you use the two bright spots here today to inspire your thinking, enhance what you're doing at your organization and your current approach, as this will help improve healthcare for all of us around this nation of ours. Uh, I always like saying that we put this podcast on for all of you listening so you can help make this country a better place. This is your Bright Spots in Healthcare podcast. Until next time, take care, everyone. Thank you.